Today we'll be discussing the recent Academy Award winning movie Another Round, and we'll be asking the question, is it wine o'clock yet? This is Doctor vs. Comedian. I'm Dr. Asif Doja, and this is the Doctor of Laughs. Not a real doctor. Ali Hassan. Every episode, I pick a topic for Ali from comedy and entertainment, and I question him about it. Then Ali picks a topic from medicine and health and grills me on that topic. Today, we'll be speaking about the recent Academy Award winning film, Another Round. And we'll be asking the question, isn't one o'clock yet? But first, Ali, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing all right. How did it feel to pronounce Ali three different ways in that intro? Is yeah, that we really need a show about the uh, pronunciation of our names, but that's... We're going to uh, do it. There's a lot there. It's three letters, my name, and 11 pronunciations, 11 different ways to get it. We should talk about that. How are things going in your world, in the world of medicine? That still exists, right? That's still a thing, medicine? Yeah, it's pretty good. You know, I thought of something the other day. I thought about, you know, we have to wear masks at work. Just, I mean, most people are wearing masks when they go indoors these days to like grocery shopping or things like that. thought about some couple benefits of masks that maybe were unintended. Like mm -hmm. if you have a breakout of acne on your face, nobody can see it, right? That coffee breath <laughs> that you have, you're insulated from that. So there are some pros to these masks other than preventing those. Those are both a bit of a stretch. First of all, the mask is going to exacerbate any acne, I'm guessing, that you may mm, have. That also happens. That also happens. Not a doctor, but knew that. And then also... Uh, the unfortunate part about your coffee or your onion breath is you still have to deal with your own. You're still polluting your own body. Normally, your breath just breathes out into the air. So I think that's a strike. Listen, man, you don't wear glasses, right? Have you started wearing glasses? I wear glasses when I drive, actually. Okay. That's the only time. And if I'm maybe watching a movie or going to a lecture where it's like really far away. Okay. So generally, mask and glasses together don't happen for you, right? No, but at work, you have to wear eye protection. Yeah. Right. Like eye goggles. So you're talking about the good old fog? Awful. The fog. And I know there's some genuinely awful things that have happened during this pandemic for people. Horrific things, unspeakable things. So it feels weird to be like, I hate when my glasses fog up, but I really hate when my glasses fog up. I'm like breathing downwards. Like I'm going to have an overbite by the end of this thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, so that I breathe down and not up into my goggles. But anyway, also people love to tell you when your glasses are fogged up. That's all right. <laughs> Papa, your glasses are fogged up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I didn't notice that. You just thought you got cataracts in like a millisecond, yeah. suddenly you developed yeah. cataracts. But listen, there's a trick that people in healthcare know, because a lot of people in healthcare have to wear glasses and masks even before the pandemic. So people in the OR. Oh, do share, please. Thanks. So you need a mask that has something that you could pinch at the top. Yeah. So medical quality masks often do. And some cloth masks will have a little maybe piece of metal or plastic that they put in that's malleable. And mm -hmm. you have to pinch that hard against the bridge of your nose to create a bit of a seal. And that's usually what, it's not a hundred percent for sure, but that's the truth. I really thought you had some revolutionary thing you were <laughs> going to talk about here. I've been pinching till my nose is almost bruised on top. I've done the pinching, but you know, like a synchronized swimmers have those extra nose plugs. Those, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I might do. have to invest in a pair of that just to do a little extra pinching. Oh, I think I close, close bin was probably fine. Close bin. <laughs> we just really don't care about what we look like anymore. He has an overbite and he still wears a clothespin, even though the pandemic's over. That's what people are going to say about me. All right, let's get this thing started. Okay, so Ali, what I want to ask you today was about this movie, Another Round. This movie is by Thomas Vinterberg. It's from Denmark, and he's from Denmark. And I just won uh, the best, you know, they change the name all the time. I think it's not foreign language film. I think it's best film not in the English language. It yeah. changes all the time. No, it's best international film. The Golden Globes call it best film not in English language. Right. Because Minari is an American movie that was nominated. Right. And it's Set not in, in this film. category. Right. It was in Best Picture. So this is Best International Film. But then you could uh, also be nominated for that, like Parasite was the I don't know. It's all confusing. But anyway, it won Best International Film. And so I guess I want to ask you a couple of things, you know, what you think about the movie, but also about, you know, what you know about his development 
And what do you think about the messaging kind of of this movie? Because I find it very interesting in terms of its thoughts on alcohol. Right. Well, I'll tell people about this movie first and foremost, just because it's Oscar winning. I think you assume that therefore everybody mm-hmm, mm-hmm. has watched it. But there are people who have lives that involve <laughs> not movie watching all the time, constantly like you do. I still don't know where you find that time, but it is pretty amazing to hear about. Another round I watched in preparation of this chat and I loved it. It stars four people. If you are not a foreign film watcher, of those four uh, fantastic actors, the four co-leads, the one that you may know is Mads Mikkelsen. Mm-hmm. And Mads, if you watched Hannibal recently, right? He yeah, was, the TV he show. Was yeah. The TV show. He played the lead Dr. Hannibal Lecter. Yes. Yeah, so he was also in Doctor Strange, the Marvel movie. He right. was the main Right, right, right. More recently that. Movie, that. Yeah. I mentioned Hannibal because it filmed out of Toronto, which is where I'm based. And so we used to run into him. He used to, a chicken wing bar, a pub where we used to do comedy on Saturday nights was a place where he hung out. His hotel was there and he was filming in Toronto for a long time. So I get to chat with him and a lot of the guys who did that comedy show regularly, particularly the hosts of that show, really got to know Mads and would play darts with him. And by all accounts, a really, really wonderful guy. I have another connection with Mads Mikkelsen that Mads has no idea about. And I'm pretty glad in this moment that I didn't tell him about. If you're a James Bond fan, he played a James Bond villain Mm -hmm. many years ago, Le Chiffre. And Le Chiffre was known for bleeding out his eye when he experienced some level of Casino Royale was a movie. Stress in Casino Royale, right? So I was auditioning many years ago for a show called George Strombolopoulos Tonight, which is a big deal in Canada. It was a a nightly show. We don't have a ton of those. Every night, George Strombolopoulos Tonight would be on. Mm -hmm. And I was auditioning to be on a comedy panel. So I'm in the auditions, my first audition, and there were going to be a number of auditions. The first audition, I'm already a little bit nervous about like who's in the auditioning room. It's the who's who of Toronto comedy at the very least. And in preparation, I shave and I shave a mole on my upper lip and I cut it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how often you cut a mole on your body. It bleeds quite a bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Confirm that, doctor? A mole? Yeah, I don't. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, not from my personal experience, but I'm familiar with your mole and I'm familiar with moles. So, yeah, it would happen. Yeah. It's weird to say that you're familiar with my mole. That's my mole. You stay out of my mole. Anyway, I sliced this thing on my upper lip as I was shaving. So I went bleeding, like literally oh bleeds God. for five hours and the audition was in 90 minutes. So I bled through the audition and I started with an apology. I was like, guys, apology. Uh, I'm a little bit like a James Bond villain. Rather than bleeding out the side of my eye, I'm bleeding out of my <laughs> upper lip. And we all laughed and they said, oh, you can barely notice it. But actually I had this square tissue that I had been dabbing my upper lip with. And it had about, without exaggeration, 45 dots of blood on it. And they're like, oh, you can't even notice it. And like, eh, you can notice it. So <laughs> I bled through that entire audition. And every time I did a pretend laugh and I went, oh, <laughs> and covered my mouth as if to pretend I was laughing, but I was really just dabbing my my mole blood. And I think the moral of the story is I got the job. I was on the George Trumbull office. So if you can find a way to bleed on your face in an interview, great talking point. And I think a pathway to success, if I can take that one anecdote and turn it into just a universal truth. Were you able to tell Mads Mikkelsen that story or no, that was I'm not, not sure. the right? He was just too nice a guy and he was really cool and relaxed. And I'm sure he would have, you know, humored me. I think back when I met him, I was still embarrassed of that fact. I wasn't now. It's been almost 10 years. You know, I can talk about bleeding out it, of my it's face. It's also, he would have had to tell you, that was a movie. I don't actually bleed out of my eyes. Right. It would have been uncomfortable. Exactly. So anyway, Mads Mikkelsen, phenomenal actor. And I would encourage people to look up all four of these gentlemen. It really is quite a, a master class in acting. The direction also is so intimate and so close up and it's uh, a wonderful thing. Anyway, I'll tell you about the concept of the movie. Mm -hmm. And and it's interesting because another round refers to another round of alcohol. And this movie was originally supposed to be Thomas Vinterberg had said it was a celebration of alcohol based on the thesis that, you know, the world would have been different without it. But unfortunately, into the filming process, a few days in, Thomas Vinterberg, the director's daughter, died. And she died in a car accident unrelated to alcohol, but she had been a big part of 
creating the play that led to the film and telling her father about the Danish drinking culture among the youth. And she had been almost sort of like a consultant to him on this film. And after that tragedy, the script sort of got reworked and it was more a movie about the ups and downs, the good and the bad that alcohol can create, you know, and it wasn't just about drinking. It was more about life and being awakened to life. So these four gentlemen, these four friends, they are high school teachers. They come across a study or they know about a study. Mm -hmm. One of them knows a study by some Norwegian psychologist who says that you operate at a negative blood alcohol content, negative 0.5, suggesting that you need Mm 0.5 just to get sort of to a normal level. Normal meaning where you'd be confident and you'd be most yourself. You start at negative 0.5 and you want to drink till you get up to zero. So they're into it all four of them going through various issues in their life. And they say, all right, let's give this a try. So as to not be viewed as alcoholics, they say we only drink until we're at that level and we never drink after 8 p.m. We control it. The Mm -hmm. booze doesn't control Mm -hmm. us. We control it. They're like, well, let's write about it. This is obviously something clinical that we're doing. Let's, Let's study it. And it starts off innocently enough. And as you may already be guessing, it kind of goes off the rails. But... I can't say enough good things about this film. I really, really, it's a foreign film. It's really, you have to understand it moves at a different pace. It's over two hours long. But if you appreciate incredible direction and filmmaking and acting, especially acting, I would definitely recommend this film. But also it gets you thinking and talking about alcohol in a significant way. Right. And so I do want to talk a bit about that as well. Uh, By the way, people are probably wondering like what that means to have that blood alcohol level. So while I was watching the movie, because I was watching it at home, I paused it and I was looking it up to try and find out what that would be. It's about like a drink an hour, they say, you know, if you're a normal metabolizer of alcohol. uh, Right. And where we live in the province of Ontario, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think 0.08, you're not allowed to drive above that level, right? If you below it, or is it 0.07 or 0.08? I'm not sure, but this is around the legal limit in some places. Let's say that. It's around the legal limit. It's not totally loopy. It's just that, whatever, if you're a drinker, you know that feeling after one glass of wine or a pint of beer, that sort of looseness. It's everybody at the cottage. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You wake up, (laughs) you have some breakfast, and then you just keep that blood alcohol level at a steady rate all day long. And to be fair, in the movie, as you'll see, they put a hold on driving when they start doing this, you know? So drinking and driving is an issue. There's other issues that certainly come up. So a couple of things I want to touch on in terms of what you talked about. Uh, First of all, the influence of his daughter in this movie is felt at the end of the movie. There's Thomas Vinterberg, the director we're talking about, right? Yeah, no, because there are some actors who have daughters as well in this or children as well. Apologies. Yeah. So his daughter, there's a title card at the very end of the movie that says for Ida. So this was dedicated Mm -hmm. to, and if you watched his Oscar acceptance speech, very emotional. And as we were watching it, my wife hadn't seen the movie. So I said, you know, he's hinted at his daughter, just wait and see what happens. And then towards the end of his speech, he kind of talks about this and he tears up a very emotional speech. I, I highly suggest you watch it because it's a real tribute to his daughter. Thomas Vinterberg, he looks so young when I saw these photos of him at the Oscars. Mm. It's probably just because I'm older now, but... He's just a good-looking man who takes yeah, care of himself. Totally, in his, his totally. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he got to prominence with Lars von Trier in the 90s with their Dogma 95 movement. I'm sure you've heard about this. This was this movement uh, coming mainly from Europe and where these guys were from, where it was a minimalist cinema. So they had all these rules that you had to follow. Right. On location only, no sets, natural lighting, handheld cameras, no score. Very, very strict in terms of how they want to do things. Lars von Trier really has taken this the most, but the first movie was A Celebration, which I saw back in 95, which was Thomas Vinterberg's main dogma 95 movie. Amazing movie. And there's always in these movies, it's always a comment on human nature and the human experience. Sure. But there's a blackness to associate to most of these movies. And those of you who've seen Lars von Trier's movies, you know, there's a lot of blackness in those movies mm. and a lot of melancholy. And so he was part of that thing. And then I hadn't heard a lot about him, honestly, you know, until this movie. He's certainly been making movies over time, but these are the only two of his that I've, I've seen. 
Yeah, and the premise also, by the way, there's also the method element of getting into character. These All four of these leads and Thomas Vinterberg would drink together and then measure their amount mm-hmm. and see how it affected them. And they would study at different levels. Okay, we're at 0.05. Now we're at 0.08. Look at how we're acting. We're at point. Um, how does the math work? Anyway, we're double 0.05. <laughs> we're 0.10. Oh, yes. And they would study various drunkards on YouTube and watch videos together and see how you... Half of being drunk is trying to pretend you're not drunk. Thomas Vinterberg conceived of this movie. It's funny because the movie, you said that movie was called Celebration. Then there's one called Last Round. This is called Another Round. Mm. It seems like it's always a party. And with Thomas Vinterberg, you can be sure that it's not entirely a party when he's filming. But he said in 2010, 2011, he started talking with another producer, director, friend of his about this idea of like how many things in history would not have happened the way they happened had it not been for alcohol. So, And then they said, forget historical stuff. What about one of his friends said, what about how many couples do you know who met sober and they both admitted not that many which is uh that's a problem i think right <laughs> it, it, <laughs> i'm not sure yeah. if you want to build a relationship I around agree. you're not the woman i met you're not the man i met you know i mean it's bad news you know in preparation for us talking about this i read an interesting article it's in i think a journal you read all the time rolling stone adaptive human behavior and physiology oh. mm. and the title of it is the functional benefits of modest modest is in quotation marks alcohol consumption And basically what the authors argue is that – and we're going to talk about the health benefits or not of alcohol maybe in the second Mm -hmm. section of the podcast. But they talk about how alcohol consumption has social benefits and it can relate to kind of social bonding. And when people are having alcohol, they're more engaged with each other. They feel more supported by each other. They're trusting of their local communities. Think about your neighborhood barbecues in North America where people get together, tailgate parties, right? Mm -hmm. Bonding over your sports teams. And they talk about how you get this trigger of the endorphin system from alcohol, especially early on in alcohol consumption in an evening, for example, and you get the same effect as laughter, singing, dancing. And those things often occur together, as you mentioned. People do that in bars and nightclubs and things like that. And so that was the kind of argument they were bringing up was this. So I don't know. I thought that kind of dovetailed what you were talking about. Well, that dovetailed into that. And now that'll dovetail into this, if I can double dovetail here, because Mm. I also, you're not the only one reading, Asif, by the way. I read as well about... This idea that, and I'm just absolutely embarrassed because I have heard about this when you have these placebo experiments where half the people are given actual alcohol, half of them are given a placebo that has no alcohol in it. But you put people in a bar, there's loud music, there's that dancing you talk about, there's that mood. And the people with the whatever virgin mojitos seem equally drunk and feel equally drunk, right? So there's this collective uh, ecstasy that is also very powerful without alcohol itself, which is very interesting because there was a guy in my high school who didn't drink when we drank and he would be like, I don't even need to drink, guys. I just hang around with you guys and I get more drunk than any of you. And he sounded like such a moron. And we were like, dude, just say you don't drink. This is the worst excuse to be sober we've ever heard about. Anyway, my apologies to Fergie Groundwater. He was onto something. And he actually was an incredibly bright and we should have known. He was such a smart dude. So his name sounds made up. So let's just assume it's a made up name. Fergus. Fergus Groundwater is a real person. Uh, a why, really why are you a, doing a that? good guy. <laughs> anyway. I just called him brilliant. I called him brilliant because that's what he was. And it's true. And in fact, the final scene in the movie. So the movie kind of builds up kind of over their school year. You'll see what happens. It actually starts around the middle of their school year, I believe. And it kind of culminates at the end of the school year in Denmark. And this is what Vinterberg's daughter was kind of the impetus for this, the movie, is that, you know, drinking culture is very intertwined with the identity of Denmark and especially of Denmark youth. And at the end of the movie, I I won't spoil exactly what happens, but if you've seen some clips, people are playing a lot of this clips for the movie in terms of Oscars and things like that, because there's a very interesting scene that happens at the end. But it's like the celebration of these graduating students, you know, and they all dress up. They wear these very unusual hats, not like the ones that we wear in North America where you have the squarish hat and the tassel. You move the tassel over. It's not like that. They wear a different hat and they run around the town uh, celebrating and drinking and things like that. And Thomas Vinterberg said that actually in that scene, 
they did not give any of the students a drop of alcohol. But if you watch the scene, they definitely all look like they're drunk and partying. Right. But he's like, this is the environment. We created this environment, naturalistic environment, as we talked about. And this movie, by the way, is not done in pure Dogma 95 style. There's many, many things that are not. There's a lot of music cues, as you know, Ali, and sure. there's some things like that. But, but I'm really glad you brought up Dogma because you'll notice where some Hollywood director might have used a score to punctuate moments. I feel like Vinterberg might you know, just linger longer mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. the face of somebody and really let the acting stand out uh, without any music or extra and using just time, shadow, maybe that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. There are moments where I noticed that only because of what you're saying. So speaking of which, did you hear about, so as I was watching this movie, I'm like, they're going to make a remake of this, an American remake. Mm -hmm. That is almost for sure. But I'm like, this movie is not a flat out comedy, right? It's not old school. But that's what I thought. I thought this is going to be Will Ferrell's next vehicle, right? Oh, yeah. You can imagine Will Ferrell as a teacher, dissatisfied with his job, very straight laced, because he can do that role. He can. I mean, so you're talking about him being very, I mean, it's like reprising Frank the Tank from old school. Right. That's the thing. It's too funny. And you know what I really, I do like going into movies without knowing too much about them. And that served me huge this time, mm -hmm. because if you go to the Wikipedia page, and I'm going to preface this by saying this is not exactly accurate in my mind. This is called a comedy drama, this film. Another round mm -hmm. is called a comedy drama. I did not know that, and I thought it was a drama. And so the moments of comedy that do come are just like a nice, unexpected bonus mm -hmm. for a beautiful film. I think comedy is too strong for, I for totally what this agree. is. So that's why I don't see Will Ferrell. Yeah, even I did the opposite. I read it as a comedy drama, and then I watched it. I'm like, no, it's funny in some parts. There's one particular scene which is hilarious. And so anyway, so it was picked up by an American production company. And do you know which actor's production company it was picked up by? I couldn't even know. It was no picked annoying. up by Leonardo DiCaprio's production company. Which does not mean that Leo will play one of no, those teachers it, necessarily. But not his, necessarily. Okay, okay. He certainly, I'm sure he loves this movie and he, I'm sure he was part of this decision making process. But when you think about it, you're like, that's actually a pretty good choice because, and I'll point you to uh, me, people like, well, I don't find DiCaprio that funny, but you have to watch probably the movie, which I love is Wolf of Wall Street mm -hmm. and the scene where he ends up taking, I don't know what he was taking, some sort of drug, like some sort of tranquilizer, muscle paralyzer, mm -hmm. prelude or something. And yeah. I don't know if you remember the scene where he has to get out of he do? his car. He has like a Ferrari or something. He has to get out of his car. He's going to his house or the country club. I mean, it is hilarious. And even in Once Upon a Time in America, yeah. he is funny. And this is what you need. You need a dramatic you actor. You Once I Upon think. a Time in Hollywood? That's what I meant. Once Upon a Time in America is another movie completely. Yeah. Yes, I once don't believe DiCaprio was he in. He was yeah, not okay. in that movie. He's like 30 <laughs> years old. So no, I uh, set no, you once up as a movie buff and you're really a failing a little. Yeah. Embarrassing. No, no. Leonardo DiCaprio understands comedy at a fundamental level, physical and delivery and all that. So that's great. It's a very tricky thing. You know, like I think of the movie The Upside. You know the movie The Upside? I didn't see that. Well, it's Kevin Hart and Brian Cranston. Now, I'll, oh, right. Yeah. I'll I, I, know, I know about the movie. Yeah. You know I, about the movie. Yeah, heard, but yeah. we had seen the French version, my wife ah, and I. Right. Look, I don't know if the story is flawless, but the acting is flawless. Mm -hmm. And it's beautifully told. And it's one of the greatest French movies I've seen. And then you see Kevin Hart and Brian Cranston have been in the remake. And you're like, I, yeah, I, it was too much of a good thing. I don't know. I don't know if I'm, I know the plot of that movie. I don't want to get into too much of it aside, but that plot of that movie is, I believe, Brian Cranston in the remake plays a person who is, I think, is quadriplegic. Yes, I believe. Yeah, and Kevin Hart is kind of like the person who comes in as his helper, it's aid, a caretaker. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. caretaker. Yeah. And what ensues? But then, even just that description that I just gave, Kevin Hart and Brian Cranston, you're like, oh, that sounds hilarious. But I haven't seen the French movie, but I'm sure hilarious is not like it's probably funny and poignant and dramatic. And mm -hmm. like we're talking about, that's a pretty hard balance strike, yeah. to strike. And I do think they accomplish it in this movie. Like I really enjoyed this movie. And, and it's, again, one of those movies that we've seen in this year where you watch it and you think about it more and more and what it's trying to say about the world we're living in now, especially, and the use of alcohol, which of course has been increased during this pandemic. Segway Joe over here, huh? Joey Segway, working his magic.
Great work, Asif. Now, we would be remiss not to have uh, discussed another round as a film that puts drinking front and center as its theme, and then to not talk about drinking from a medical standpoint. So I'm just going to put it to you like this. Alcohol, delicious and good for you. Yes? <laughs> well, I mean, there is... <laughs> I, <laughs> The most loaded question you could ask. I know. I'm just trying to open up a discussion here. But look, you mentioned the pandemic. It is right now a big thing. Like, I'd be exaggerating by quite a bit if I said my wife used to drink once a month. Even once a month, not, you know, she can go a full six months and not drink. But then when she sees you and your wife at the cottage, for example, maybe she'll have a few drinks, but she can easily go a long time. But then all of a sudden, something about this pandemic. You have so little, you have so much time together and you have so little to do, especially during lockdowns. You know, we started sitting on our front steps, on our front porch, like an old European couple, judging people in the neighborhood <laughs> and having sips of a few beverages. And it became a, kind of a regular thing. Now, for my wife, regular is like maybe twice a week, three times a week is insane for her. But I know personally that I, when I go out and do stand-up comedy, which is probably about five nights a week, let's say, there's a limit on how much I'll drink because I'm always driving. I'm 98% of the time I'm driving. So at the most, it'll be three drinks over three hours, four hours. Once you're at home, you don't have that thing. I found even in my comfort of my own home, rather than, you know, hey, let's wrap this up early. There was times you feel mm -hmm. sorry for yourself in a pandemic. You're like, why? Why should I wrap this up early? Because I won't feel awful tomorrow? <laughs> Not good enough. Not good enough a reason. But yeah, tell me about in your practice, in your world, does drinking in the pandemic, is it part of something you see? Yeah, well... I see children with neurologic diseases, so not really. No, I was thinking more about maybe their parents, their coping mechanisms. or. So that's a good point. They use alcohol as a coping mechanism, but maybe we should talk about that. I definitely feel this heightened level of stress and anxiety. I mean, as I always tell people, you know, when I see a kid in clinic, I said, you know, how are you doing? Any anxiety or stress these days? And they're like, no. I'm like, oh, that's interesting because 7 billion other people in the world <laughs> are anxious and stressed. So not you. I say it in a joking way, not a yes. condescending way in case you okay. want to judge me there, Ali. No, but <laughs> I, I, I joke around with them about that and try and open up the conversation a bit because I think we need to be honest about that. And often, you know, you have a good point, Ali. I'm thinking about the kids, right? Because that's my primary concern. Of course. But there's a secondary concern and how is the anxiety and stress of those parents impacting the illness of the child? And sometimes mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, I don't give enough care and thinking to that. And I probably should be. I'm available as a consultant, you know? I mean, I'm sure if there's a budget, we can probably bring me in. I'm sure already the wisdom that I've imparted to you during this podcast, these first dozen episodes. I well, mean, I'll bring it up to my uh, CEO, please Mr. Do. Mr. Okay, Alex good. Munter, but I'll leave it up to him. <laughs> so listen, you are right that drinking has gone up. So in Canada, there is a Statistics Canada survey that came out in January of this year that said many Canadians aren't just having a one glass of wine or, or a beer at nighttime, almost one in five who responded to the survey said they consumed five or more drinks, the equivalent to a bottle of wine, on the days they reported drinking alcohol in the previous month. So at a sitting, equivalent of a bottle of wine. Definitely drinking has gone up. Are we saying that's a bad thing or? Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Continue, please. All right. Your tone didn't suggest if that was good or bad. You just presented it as fact. Okay. Well, yeah, I guess I'm trying to be objective in all this, but yeah. it's been other people like the, again, public health has been so concerned, obviously, with COVID vaccinations, preventing spread of disease, but public health is responsible for all our health in a holistic manner, right? And so there's a, a good article, which we'll link to by Don Sugarman and Shelley Greenfield, two public health experts. And they said, you know, alcohol and COVID-19 is a growing crisis. And I was talking to my wife the other day, and I'm like, once we get COVID under control, the scary thing is dealing with the after effects, right? And I likened it to World War II. We won. The Allies won and defeated the Axis powers. But the PTSD 
And when you conscripted these men and women, you know, to mm -hmm. fight or our women who were relocated to different jobs in order to help with the war effort, the after effects of that can be felt for a long time. And I'm not trying to be a super downer, but the after effects of this are going to be felt for a very long time, even once we get COVID under control. I can't imagine uh, most of our listeners not reaching for a drink after hearing you say <laughs> that. I think this entire thing is having the opposite effect. But yeah, I think that's, of, I mean... You'd have to be really not paying attention to not feel exactly what you're saying. And so Sugarman and Greenfield talk about this. They review the literature on this. They said one study looking at all the pandemic lockdown in London, England, was an increased risk factor for alcohol consumption. Even in people who are alcohol abusers, relapsed, like increased risk of relapse who were previously abstinent. An Australian study said that 30% of people were drinking, in quotation marks, a lot more than normal during the mm. pandemic. And they also found that in that same study that there were some predictors of increased alcohol use during the pandemic. One of them is age 25 to 64, lots of people, yeah. higher income bracket, interestingly, and a history of having mental illness, which is obviously concerning. But the biggest concern was an uh, increase in women. Being a yeah. woman was a risk factor. And in the US, studies have shown that there's considerable psychological distress associated with COVID-19, and it's associated with alcohol use, and the association was more pronounced. In other words, the association between distress from COVID-19 and increased alcohol use was more associated or seen more frequently in women than in men. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. I have an incredibly complicated relationship with alcohol. You know, my father was a heavy drinker. I've tried to always keep my drinking under control. It has not been successful. I always think about this one joke, and I wish I could credit the comedian who talked about it, but it was this idea of like, if you went to like a dragon's den or a shark tank and you presented them with this product, alcohol, today, it did not exist. You would be laughed and maybe beaten out of the room. People would be like, are you a maniac? Of course, we're not going to approve that product. Right. You just think about alcohol. Somebody goes, yeah, there's this product. I have booze. Oh, as long as it doesn't harm anybody. No, no, no. It does harm people. It harms people who drink it. And people can harm not only themselves, but others as well. And it can rip apart families and it can create social chaos and huge bills for cities as they repair the damage done. You'd be like, no, we're never going to approve this. So when I have seen, you know, you, we jokingly said off the top, is it wine o'clock yet? But in fact, rather than alcohol kind of reeling in a little bit, encouraging any responsibility, these memes come out, these very... Look, you're using World War II analogies, so let me use analogies also the way, you know, a people are dehumanized so that they can be oppressed or ignored or marginalized some way. I feel like the flip has happened with booze rather than talking about the ills and the negative effects. Wine is like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. It's just wine, you know, and you have all these like, oh, I only drink when I'm alone or with someone. <laughs> uh, if you don't like my cooking, wait till you try my wine. This kind of like, it's wine. And it's nothing. So we've turned it into this banal negative thing. And that wine o'clock thing is very much, obviously, I'm sure, I don't think I'm speaking out of school here by saying women probably drink more wine than men do. I think wine has always been marketed to women more. I know that, you know, in our house when we're having couples over, again, anecdotal, but it's usually the women are like, oh, I'll, I'll have red or I'll have white or sometimes gin. But usually... It's more rare to have a woman say, yeah, if you have scotch, I'm set. Or if you have beer, I'm all set. This, um, what do you want to call it? Turning wine and alcohol consumption into a joke, mm -hmm. particularly in wine, seems directed directly at women. So if, from that perspective, it's not a surprise that drinking and ill effects of drinking would be on the rise with women. And I keep seeing articles on so many different news outlets about alcoholism, liver disease, and consumption, all these different things mm -hmm. related, obviously, are on the rise with women. Yeah. How's that mansplaining going for you? Is that pretty good? That mansplaining? I'm just talking about what I've been reading. It's going, <laughs> it's going phenomenally well. It wasn't intended to be uh, mansplaining as well. I'm telling you, it's man to mansplaining. I'm telling you what I've been <laughs> seeing. And it is not a surprise, but it is also obviously concerning. Well, I hear what you're saying and I read some things. And so there's a blogger named Farrell Torres, who is a woman, and she wrote an interesting blog about how she's done with these wine mommy memes, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of what you're saying, like these memes are like the most expensive part of having kids is the more wine you drink 
or when life gets complicated, I whine. <laughs> she basically says that this is a negative correlation that we're trying to create. Like a parenting and being a woman is tough. And the answer is whine and let's make a joke about it. And she kind of wants to put a stop to that essentially. So we'll link to her blog. And I think it's an interesting point that she brings up. And you know what? Going back to our original discussion, which was about that movie, Another Round, the premise of the whole movie is that things would not have happened without alcohol. But we can also look at the world and be like, look at all the things that do happen mm -hmm. without alcohol's help. For example, the billions of people who have raised children without the help of alcohol. And I think, I don't know if I've read that particular woman's article, but I did read one piece that where somebody was like, we're equating child rearing to something negative. And then the solution for that negative thing is then yeah, have something a drink. more negative. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if it was, but again, like, as I said, I've just been reading so many articles about this. I'm a little bit consumed, excuse the pun. Yeah, no. And this blogger also talks about the wine at play dates types of things. And so there's a couple things to, I think, address here from a scientific evidence point of view. So one is that there is some evidence that two or more drinks per day results in a 50% increase in breast cancer. We'll talk about the risks and benefits of drinking as a whole maybe in a few minutes. About three quarters of Canadian women consume alcohol. More than 30% exceed the low risk guidelines and nearly half are heavy drinkers, meaning they put back four or more drinks on at least one occasion at least once a month. In Canada, in 2018, there was a report on the state of public health from Canada's chief public health officer. In 2018, nobody knew who that was, but you know who Canada's chief public health officer is now, Teresa Tam. She identified that alcohol use in women is one of the most pressing concerns of our time. This is pre-COVID, but it was identified about three years mm -hmm. ago. And it highlighted that deaths attributed to alcohol between 2011 and 2017 increased by 26% amongst Canadian women. Well, alcohol-related deaths in men increased by just 5%. So the increase was higher amongst women. This is concerning. There's also a study looking at emergency rooms in Canada, and they found that men and lower-income individuals have the highest burden of emergency visits related to alcohol use. But again, the biggest increases were in women and younger adults. So again, it's all saying that this trend is going in the wrong direction with these increases mm -hmm. in women drinking and, and having medical complications from that. So, you know, it's interesting when you read some of these articles about the stress that women are under and what some of these reasons might be for this increased alcohol consumption. There's a great article from CBC News, which I'll link to, and they quote Dr. Jennifer Wyman, who is Associate Director of the Substance Use Service at Women's College Hospital in Toronto. And she said, basically, women have to fill so many roles. They have their work life. They have their social roles with their friends. Of course, many of them are mothers. Many of them are spouses. And they have all these roles. And Dr. Wyman thinks that women tend to drink as a coping mechanism, and they're almost counting down the time until they can have this glass of wine. And there's also Anne Dowsett Johnson, who wrote a book called Drink, colon, the mm. intimate relationship between women and alcohol. If you read any news articles about women increased it's drinking, often quoted. they're yeah. talking to her because she's really an expert in this. And she says, the you know, same thing we were saying, there's too much humor about the mummy drinking. And she says, you know, women are racing from a busy day of the office to have to put dinner on the table. And it's easier to pour yourself a glass of wine than to get to a yoga class. And her concern is that she says, women see alcohol as a re reward for their busy lives. And it's self-medicating to deal with stress, mm -hmm. right? And she says, as women progress so many ways in our culture, it's the one thing that's going sideways. So there's a couple articles in CBC, she's quoted in Chatelaine Magazine, there's another article where she's quoted. So again, we'll link to those, but it raises a good point. And a lot of this was pre-pandemic. Now we're talking about in the pandemic. And these the stressors and these other roles that women have just in speaking to my wife and speaking to my female colleagues, it's such a hard balancing act to do. So I think there's even more stress. And I think during the pandemic, a lot of these burdens are shifted to women, unfortunately. And again, this is what my wife and uh, what other female colleagues have been telling me. So I think it's definitely something that we have to watch and address, but I don't know about any easy solutions to it because like I said, there's a lot of burdens being put on women. Yeah, I know a few women who were drinkers, and once the pandemic hit, 
stop drinking because they are, I guess, visionaries who are like, I know where this could go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now I have to work from home and I'm with my kids and I so in incredible admiration of how you can sort of see that and cut it off before it becomes an issue. But I'm just reminded of my dad in the 90s when these studies came out about a couple of glasses of wine are good for mm-hmm. you. And he was like mm-hmm. parading around the house, waving the newspaper And it was like, but dad, you don't even drink red wine and you rarely drink only two glasses. So I'm not sure what the celebration is. Eventually he started drinking wine and he got it in check. But it's funny, we celebrate these things. And I just want to mention this. I'm by no means saying hopefully women will start drinking less. Women can do whatever they want. But I think as a society, we all need to pay attention to our drinking. And my heroes are the people who are like, pandemic's coming. I'm locking up the booze cupboard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of insight with those people have about that. But, you know, it gets to kind of to wrap things up. It gets to the question that you're asking, like, well, is there an amount of alcohol that's healthy for you or not? Right? Yeah, that's exactly where I'm going. Because look at the French. Look at the Italians. Mm -hmm. Two glasses, moderation. Now, many of us have not followed the example of moderation. But I'm talking about had we. Had we followed moderation What are your thoughts based on what you know? Is it still a benefit to have one glass of booze or two glasses of wine and cap it there? I mean, there's been lots of literature about this. And so if you look at the cardiovascular benefits, which is what we talk about the most, if you look at what are called, again, we've talked about systematic reviews before where they look at all the studies that have been done on it. It actually does suggest that moderate drinking, which is probably one to two glasses of, say, wine per day for a man and one a day for a woman, has benefits from cardiovascular point of view, so preventing heart disease and stroke. So that would make sense. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that's like per day. So that's like this kind of very moderate drinking per day. You can't have all those seven drinks on like a weekend, sure. you know, and have the same benefit. And so it's this kind of small amount balanced out. And there is scientific evidence for that. But, uh, and I'll link to this too, the Harvard School of Public Health has a good article. It's not a scientific article, it's just designed for the average person to kind of take a look at how do I weigh these risks and benefits based on this evidence. And so, first of all, they say, if you don't drink, you don't need to start, right? Don't start <laughs> drinking just for the benefits. For the sure. benefits, right? But if you're thin, active, you don't smoke, you have a good diet, alcohol isn't really going to help you as well. You know, so again, you're living a healthy lifestyle. There's no need to start drinking for that. If you're a man who is at a moderate to high risk of heart disease, maybe you want to consider it. I.e. brown. (laughs) It it might help some of these people who have a low HDL because we know higher HDL is protective against heart disease and it's very hard to move up your HDL. And that's a problem a lot of South Asian people will have. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that could maybe move up. But again, the caveat is if you have no history of alcoholism, or I would say you're not an addictive personality. And then with women, okay, well, maybe if you have a moderate risk of heart disease, again, well, maybe you want to consider it, but it has to be balanced against the breast cancer risk. So these are, again, I know we've said this many times before, this is a discussion that needs to happen with your healthcare provider because it's different for every person. And so you really want to have these kind of conversations to see. So that's kind of the advice. And I really like this Harvard School of Public Health article. So those are the recommendations from Harvard, but we need to put this in context of the potential harms of alcohol. And that's what you have to balance out, right? And so a couple facts, and I'll talk about some American and Canadian facts. So in Canada, alcohol is the most common drug used by Canadians. And it's weird because you're like, well, what are you talking about? Drugs is like marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy, and things like that. It's like, no, alcohol is, is a drug, just as you were saying with that joke from that comedian, right? Mm-hmm. 15% of Canadians consume more than what's suggested a low-risk guidelines, which is like no more than 10 drinks a week for women and 15 drinks a week for men. So 15% consume more than that. Risky alcohol use still occurs a lot amongst young adults and has been increasing over time. The rate of hospitalizations caused by alcohol is comparable in Canada to the rate of hospitalizations for heart attacks. That's insane. You know, and it's 13 times higher than for opioids. Every day we're talking about the opioid crisis in the news, yet nobody's talking about this. 22% of all substance use attributable deaths 
in Canada were due to alcohol. The estimated total cost of alcohol-related harm to Canadians in 2014 was felt to be $14.6 billion. So that's not just healthcare costs, but loss costs due to disability, uh, decreased work productivity, uh, criminal justice costs, you know, drinking and driving mm-hmm. and things like that. And if you look at the U.S., you see the same sort of thing. So in 2010, the CDC estimated that alcohol use cost the U.S. $249 billion per year. I mean, this is insane, these numbers we're talking about. Again, mainly decreased workplace productivity because of alcohol use affecting your work performance, healthcare expenses, again, criminal justice expenses. And of course, I didn't mention it before for Canadians, but it's obviously applicable in both countries, motor vehicle crashes, which sure, obviously there's financial losses and there's life losses, morbidity losses for people who are injured in these crashes, often these victims who are seriously injured or killed. And so there are these tremendous economic, societal, and healthcare costs because of alcohol. And so if you look at this uh, more recent study published in The Lancet, which was examining, they did a systematic analysis of this global burden of disease study, which occurred in 2016, where they looked at the global burden of disease in 195 countries and territories. And this group of authors was specifically looking at the alcohol use portion of this study. And they found that alcohol use is a leading risk factor for the global burden of disease and substantial health loss. And if you look at all cause mortality, and especially with the effect that alcohol can have on some cancers, we talked about breast cancer, but it's other cancers as well, and increasing consumption of alcohol and all the healthcare effects of this, basically there is no level of alcohol consumption that can be advocated for that will Hmm. balance out the harms of alcohol. Do you know what sure. I'm saying? Sure. So that's basically what they said. So there, there is no, and in fact, there's an editorial in that same article of Lancet and the title spells it out. No level of alcohol consumption improves health. And mm-hmm. if you read since 2018, 2019, there's been more editorials coming out saying that this is the way it is. Like we have to minimize the amount of alcohol consumption in total in society because the health burdens and the burdens to our society are just too great, despite any improvements in I can add one thing to this, and it comes from a comedian. Unfortunately, it's sad that most of my knowledge comes from comedians, but this was actually a comedian, Canadian originally living in the UK. And the UK, if you know about drinking in the UK, it is at Mm -hmm. insane levels. And of course, with our upward trending, maybe we're heading in that direction as well. But in the UK, this particular comic, I don't think he's a huge drinker, but he would take pictures every... Saturday morning, Sunday morning of vandalism and destruction of public property. That was just his sort of thing. And he would post it and he'd be like, look at this bus shelter just smashed to smithereens. Look at this place of business destroyed. Look at this. And he added, he said, I truly believe if the alcohol manufacturers, the Seagrams, all these guys, if they were handed the bill. Mm. At the end of every year, you all have to chip in and it's this many billion pounds, whatever it is, you have to pay for this because it's the alcohol that you did nothing to curb. The consumption you did nothing to curb led to all this destruction. So this is what you're up for. Only then would you ever see alcohol companies taking an interest in drinking being responsible. Otherwise, you know, messages of please drink responsibility are just complete BS and lip service. So the alcohol companies don't care about you. They don't care about me. They don't care about us. So, um, yeah, I guess the message is we have to start caring about us a little more. Huh? You want to end on that? Nobody else will. We can pretty much end every single episode. We do. We talk about (laughs) sugar. I'll end it like that. Talk about fat. I'll end it like that. That is our our episode for today. Was it a massive buzzkill? I'm sure it was. It was almost intended to be. But listen, at least from my perspective, I can't speak for Dr. Asadoja. From my perspective, it's something that sometimes I need to say and I need to hear myself. You know, the pandemic has gotten the best of me in terms of alcohol consumption. And this is a good reminder. And Dr. Doja coming in with some heavy stats to back up all this uh, opinion as well. That is our show. Thank you so much for listening. Asif, you could tell people where they can catch us. 
You can follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, Dr. V Comedian. You can also email us, drvcomedian at gmail.com. We'd love to hear what you guys think about the podcast, any suggestions for improvement, etc. Ali, anything else you have to plug? Standupali.com is the website, and you can see there's some performing happening. There's a variety of things I'm hosting, virtual, and there's a show at a drive-in theater coming up in Peterborough, Ontario. If you're in the neighborhood, I'm opening up for Sean Majumder in June. Funny guy, very funny guy. Very, very funny guy. And so far, that's going to be the highlight of the summer, a trip to Peterborough, Ontario. If you don't know about Peterborough, it's kind of, you know, I think you can make assumptions. It's a town many people haven't heard of, and yet you can never take that away from me. That is my greatest joy this summer so far. So stand up, Ellie, here. DrVersusComedian.com is our website. Hit us up. We love to hear from you. Love to take your suggestions. Thanks to everyone for listening. Remember that although I am a doctor, I'm not your doctor. Of course, neither is Ali. We established that at the beginning. Medical issues that we talk about are for your interest and information only. They're not to be considered medical advice. Please consult your medical professional for actual medical advice. We'll see you next time. See you again. See you again.